the scary stories will begin in 30 seconds. Before they do, just as a reminder, there's only three mid-roll ads in this video. One after story number one, one after story number two, and one more after story number three. After that, the rest of the video will be ad-free. And if you would like to show your support, please subscribe to my channel and hit the thumbs up. It helps me out so much. Now, let's begin. I was 13, and there was a home game in early fall. The game was a blowout, which resulted in me and my cousin leaving early to make our hour and a half walk back home. I lived across town, and my cousin lived next door to me. My dad didn't like me and my cousin walking home at night out of fear of something happening to us. The walk didn't bother me. It was relaxing. It was something that I've always enjoyed. He called my cell and asked me if he was picking us up from the game. I lied and told him that we caught a ride with some friends and that we were going to get something to eat and that I would be home between 11 and 11.30. He said that was fine and that he will be waiting for me and he'll leave the door open. As we made our way back to our little corner, which separated to a V, leading to our individual houses, we made our way down our driveways to our houses that were about 100 yards away. Halfway up my driveway, I felt something unfamiliar on this walk. It was an alert and nervous feeling. A feeling that someone would get when they are being watched. I quickly shrugged it off when I got into the porch light's reach. A cloud of calmness shadowed me, but soon ended when I heard the shout from my cousin coming through the thick brush and trees. He shouted my name, and with that followed the most eerie laugh that I've ever heard. Thinking he was in trouble, I called out to him to see if he was okay. Dead silence was the only response. I decided to give him a call as soon as I made it inside my house. I make it to the door to find out that it was locked. My dad's car is in the driveway, so I assumed that he was home. I knocked on the door and called his cell phone multiple times, but I didn't receive a response. I called his girlfriend's cell phone, thinking she might have picked him up, but she wasn't answering either. Frustrated, I decided to go next door to my cousin's house and wait for my dad to call. As I looked down my dark driveway, I had that nervous feeling creeping up again. I tried to keep my mind off of the feeling by thinking of random things, but that soon was interrupted by a twig snap. There was a rustling in the brush, and then a whisper that sounded like my name. Without hesitation, I take off in a sprint the rest of the way towards my cousin's house. I make it to the door and enter without knocking. This is where I'm greeted by my cousin's grandmother. Frightened and concerned, she asks me if everything was alright. I couldn't respond due to running so fast. I catch my breath and tell them what I heard. I then ask my cousin, why did he scream and laugh after we left each other? They had a confused look on their face, and his grandmother said that he didn't scream or laugh because she was smoking outside and watched him walk up the road. Confused, I called my dad's cell a couple more times and still didn't get an answer. It was then that my cousin offered to walk with me back to my place to see if we could get my dad to answer the door. I wasn't sure if he believed me and was concerned, or if he wanted to see if he would experience the same thing. We made it to the spot where I heard the noise and whispers, so we stopped to listen. All we heard were crickets. We made it back to my house and I started knocking again. I called his cell phone, but still did not get an answer. I decided to just sleep at my cousin's house that night. Exhausted, I leaned against my brick wall house, and that is where I saw it. A silhouette of someone barely visible in the moonlight perched in the tree. I was speechless and couldn't say anything. All I could do was nudge my cousin's shoulder and stare at the figure. My cousin fixed his eyes on what had me paralyzed and the figure jumped out of the tree. My cousin shouted at me to run. We ran faster than you could believe towards his house. The whole time, we heard twigs and brush being snapped in the woods that surrounded both sides of the road. We finally make it to his yard, and the noises stop. 
I think I hear my name once more. I turn around, and I could see the figure, perched in another tree, just staring at me. My cousin yells at me to come inside, but all I could do was stare at this person. He then grabs my arm and drags me inside, all the while looking down to the ground to prevent himself from looking at the person that had me stunned. We tell his grandmother what we had experienced. I had heard stories from other people that lived in this area, but I thought it was all lies until this night. As we grew tired, they set the couch up for me to sleep on for the night. And that night, I had the scariest dream. It bothered me so much that I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. It was the same situation, but I walked towards the whisper of my name. Out of the brush, an elderly woman walks out. She looked like a normal elderly at first, but then her face aged until it started to decay. She limps towards me and reaches out and grabs me by the arm. Then I'm woken up by a phone call from my dad at 8 a.m. I answered, and he is beyond pissed and worried. I tell him I'm on my way home and that I will explain when I get there. After being lectured, I got a chance to tell him what happened. I asked him if he had went to bed early that night, and he said he stayed up until 1 in the morning waiting for me. I showed him my call history. He didn't believe me and checked his cell phone. After seeing that I did attempt to call him, he had this very confused look on his face. He then called next door to see if I was telling the truth. My cousin's grandma told him everything that had happened. He told me that he was watching TV and unlocked the door before falling asleep. He also said that he didn't hear me knocking at 11.30, which is the time I made it back home. He didn't question me anymore about that night. My dad passed away a year later, and my cousin and his grandma moved some years back. I look up in the trees sometimes, wondering if I'll see the person sitting there again. I'm 26 now, and I'm still here in the same house. I never saw the person again. It happened again last night, whimpering. I wake myself up from a nightmare. The dream fades from my memory as soon as I wake, but still leaves me feeling frightened and shaky. I look over to my husband, but he isn't in bed. Though I want nothing more than to get up and find him, I feel too weak to move out of bed. Suddenly, I'm surrounded by people on and around my bed. They are invisible, but I can feel their hands all over me pushing me down into the mattress. I struggle as mightily as I can, but all I do is tremble. I scream harder and harder, trying to call for my husband, but all that comes is a weak squeaking. Then, I feel the hands starting to pull me off the bed, scrunching my eyes closed and taking a deep shuddering breath. I scream as hard as I possibly can and wake up. This time I know I'm truly awake. Feeling relieved, but still a little scared, I whimper, and my husband slides over, still asleep, and gathers me in his arms. I sigh quietly and fall back asleep, safe and secure in his embrace. Episodes similar to this have happened to me off and on throughout the years, though none have been as frightening as what happened shortly after watching The Ring. That was about the only horror movie I can remember that gave me nightmares. My husband worked nights at the time, and I normally stayed up waiting for him. One night though, I got too sleepy and went to bed. I'm not sure how long I'd been asleep before I woke up. I was on my back, my head facing the door, and I couldn't move a muscle. This had happened to me before, and normally didn't bother me too much. This time though, the girl from the ring was crouched at the end of my bed. She started slowly creeping up towards my head as soon as she saw me awake. I felt frozen in fear and couldn't even twitch a muscle while I lay there watching her creep closer and closer. My mind felt torn in two, one part telling me it was just a night terror and she wasn't really there. The larger part was screaming in terror, Get me out of here! 
Finally, the paralysis broke enough to whip my head in the opposite direction. Of course, she was gone when I looked again. I was wide awake after that and got up to wait for my husband to come home. As a child, my bedroom was in the basement. The walls and floor were made of cement, and I had one window up in the top left corner of my room, directly across from my bed. It was a bleak room, white walls, a small alarm clock radio, a few toys. I didn't keep many toys down there because it would flood during rainy seasons, and unfortunately for me, my window didn't have a curtain, so anyone who walked by my house could see in my window since we lived on the corner lot of a four-way street. It was most scary at night. We didn't exactly live in the best part of town. Most of our neighbors were bikers and junkies. Not that I think all bikers are bad guys, it's just that the ones on my street weren't the nicest people and often held loud parties all throughout the night. And when they would walk by, they would see my window and thought it was funny to mess with me. I would tell my parents about it, but they said there wasn't anything that could be done. They often partied with the bikers and found some humor in my torment, telling me to grow up and be a man, so I took it upon myself to take a couple nails and hammered a folded sheet over my window and kept an aluminum baseball bat my grandfather had gotten me close to my bed. At least then, I wouldn't have to worry. Or so I thought. On one particular night, when I was eight years old, I was lying in bed and noticed the silhouette of someone's legs standing by my window, illuminated by the street lamp. I just rolled over and ignored it. That was until I heard a tapping on my window, and that tapping continued until I got up and moved the sheet to see a man on his hands and knees looking directly at me, his bulging yellow eyes and broken teeth smiling through his nasty, unkempt beard, made me feel uneasy. I said, Go away, as firmly as I could, and his smile went away. I let down the sheet and went back to my bed. A couple seconds later, the tapping began again, this time faster and sort of more thin-sounding, more like a ticking. Frustrated, I got up and lifted the sheet to see the man tapping the window with a knife and a big smile once again. Over the years of this happening, I knew crying to my parents was out of the question as they never did anything. Scared and a little stupid, I flipped the guy off and shut the sheet again. The stupid part of me believed he wouldn't actually do anything because no one ever had before. They would just laugh and walk away, so it made me sort of calloused to the whole thing. That was the biggest mistake I had ever made. Before I had gotten to my bed, the man broke the glass in my window and climbed in. The window was at least five feet off the ground, so he fell to the floor. For a brief moment, I couldn't believe what was happening. Then, something clicked, and I was ready. I had sort of always hoped this would happen, so I took my aluminum bat and began beating the man as hard as a chubby eight-year-old could screaming furiously. The man curled up on the floor and cried out with every hit, occasionally trying to stop my attack by putting his hand out, attempting to grab the bat. At one point, his hand caught the bat, so I yanked it back and continued my barrage of battle axe chops. And before I knew it, my father had come bursting in the door in his underpants, ready to scream my face off, but was stopped dead in his tracks by what he had seen. My father was no small man. He was a six-foot, 240-pound construction worker. He grabbed me, pushed me out the door, and began stomping on the man and yelling for my mother to call the police. The man begged my father to stop. I told my dad not to listen since I knew that he had a knife. Anytime the man tried to move, my dad would kick him again, and eventually he had given up and stayed on the floor. The police arrived shortly after. It seems that the man dropped the knife when he fell down after getting in my window. They took the man and put him in the car. While he was in the car, 
he didn't take his eyes off of me. So I flipped him off again, and he flew into a rage in the car, screaming that he would be back. As proud as I was, it wasn't until after the police had left that I received a scolding from my crying father. Aware of his hypocrisy, he promised to bar the window first thing in the morning. My sisters and mother all in tears. The bikers were nice to me after that. To this day, I still have no nightmares of that man staring at me from my window. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I will always be a little afraid that he will come back. I live down at the Outer Banks in North Carolina. The Outer Banks is a beautiful place, a tiny peninsula on the East Coast. We moved down here when I was five because my family wanted to move to a safer, friendlier place. For the 18 years I have been alive, I have never experienced something more gut-wrenching and terrifying than I did last night. I'm a big fan of being scared, and I love listening to his scary stories. However, I never thought anything I would experience would ever come close to something like you hear in one of his videos. I work at a small restaurant on the side of the road near the beach. Our hours are from 11 to 7, and my friends and I were the ones closing up shop for the night. I said goodbye to my coworkers and left, heading back home so I could hop onto Warzone and eat some leftovers. When I got home, I said hello to my parents and went up to my room. Time passed and I spent at least three hours on my Xbox, playing with my friends, just having a good simple time. Around midnight, things started to settle down and I was about to go to bed when I remembered I needed to buy a new controller because my other one broke when my friend dropped it a couple weeks prior. So I went on to Amazon to buy a new one, but when I went to pay, I realized I didn't have my wallet on me, so I couldn't use my card. I looked all around and eventually came to the conclusion that I had left it back at the restaurant in the staff hangout area. I told my parents and they said it was okay for me to go back and get it. So I left and drove all the way back. I didn't really mind though, as I loved driving down this place. It was super peaceful, even at night. When I got to the restaurant, I noticed that the sliding window in the front of the building was wide open. I honestly didn't think much of it. I truly thought that one of us had just left it open by accident. The thought of someone breaking in never crossed my mind. Especially down here, a place that's relatively safe. I used my key to unlock the back door and I stepped inside. It was a rather small building and the staff hangout area was just down the hall. I shut the door behind me, but when I turned around, I swear, I saw something duck around the corner at the far end of the hallway. The lights weren't on yet, so the moonlight from the front windows were the only thing illuminating the building. Again, I didn't think much of it. The front window was open, so perhaps a raccoon or bird or something found its way inside. I flipped on the lights and continued about my business, trying to find my wallet. The buzz of the lights above me were the only thing I could hear other than my movement. I walked down the hall and into the staff hangout area, and sure enough, that's where my wallet was. I went to go grab it, but that's when I heard something fall over behind me. I turned and instantly got goosebumps up my arms and neck. I knew exactly what fell over, too. It was the tip jar. The sound of shattered glass and coins rattling across the floor broke the silence. I stood there for a moment and cursed. I knew if I didn't clean it up, the boss would come in the next morning and chew us out. So I put my wallet in my back pocket and grabbed the broom. I stepped out of the staff hangout area and into the front area of the restaurant. I don't know what you call it, the register station or whatever. I looked down at the ground and started to sweep up the coins and glass into the dustpan. I was going to sort the coins out separately afterwards, but now I just wanted to clean up the mess and get out of here. It took me about 15 minutes to pick up everything off the floor, and when I did, I had had enough. I was tired, and I just wanted to go home. 
I didn't really feel like sorting the coins out of the glass anymore. I figured I would just take the blame for it tomorrow. I went to the staff area to put everything back when I noticed that the door was shut. It was weird seeing the staff area door shut because it's always open. It honestly freaked me out. I didn't remember shutting it. I stood there with a dustpan full of glass and coins in my left hand and a broom in my right. I rearranged the items so I had a free hand to open the door when I heard a noise. It was a shuffling sound from the staff area. The goosebumps suddenly came back and I almost said something out loud. I bent down to the ground and placed everything I had in my hands on the floor, but as I stood back up, the doorknob began to shake, and I looked up at it terrified. I quickly skipped over to the register station area and ducked behind one of the huge shelves containing a bunch of pickle jars and other food items. I heard the staff room door open, and as it opened, I shoved my dustpan full of glass and coins to the side, spilling them all over the ground again. Now I was terrified. Someone was definitely in here with me. I was not alone. A raccoon couldn't have opened the door. My heart began to beat fast, and I didn't want to take out my phone and call the cops because the screen light could have alerted the person. The shuffling came closer, and I saw someone slowly slouch himself into my vision. It was a man, probably five feet tall at most, pretty short considering that I'm 6'3". He stepped on the shattered glass and turned and looked directly where I was hiding as if he knew I was there. He was bald and super skinny. He looked at me and his jaw dropped unbelievably far down as if the thing was broken. His eyes were deep in their sockets and drool spilled from his mouth. I screamed and ran to the front window. I yanked it open and crawled out of it, knocking over the cash register. I fell down to the ground and sprinted to my car. I didn't think about anything but getting out of there. I drove all the way back home almost crying. I didn't tell my parents because they obviously wouldn't believe me, and I didn't call the cops either. It just didn't seem like the right kind of believable situation. I told my boss that I had accidentally fallen into the cash register, knocking it and the tip jar over. He scolded me, but was surprisingly not that upset. This incident happened this Tuesday, and I will never forget. I have no idea who that man was, or why he was there. This happened to me in 2011, between 7th and 8th grade. It was a warm 4th of July evening, and I was at my friend Andrew's house for an Independence Day party he was hosting. I was certainly not the only person there, as a lot of friends from school were invited. Andrew's parents own a large house on the bluffs of a river with a huge property. The backyard led into a forest embankment, sloping downwards towards the river. We were all having fun. We went from playing video games to going to the nearby park and playing outside there, to returning to his house to play in his yard and eat dinner. After that, we stayed close to his house as the fireworks would begin in a few hours. The fireworks were going to be launched from a park across the river, giving us a perfect view. Since the house was fixed on a bluff, the forest leading down to the river wouldn't obstruct the view. The fireworks began at 10 o'clock and lasted for a good half hour. It was after that, and we unanimously agreed to play a game of manhunt or flashlight hide and seek. His backyard and forest setting made it perfect for playing the game. I was one of the hiders and decided to run into the forest since it was not off limits to the game. However, we established a boundary that we couldn't go beyond the river trail, which was about halfway between the top of the bluff and the river. I dodged the trees and hedges making my way deeper into the forest. I eventually found a large log I could easily duck behind, and that's exactly what I proceeded to do. I nestled myself in between the log and a tree. A long time passed, 
I was contemplating returning to our pre-established rendezvous area, the tree in Andrew's front yard. That's when I saw someone approaching from the trail, moving diagonally towards me. I figured it was a seeker for obvious reasons, so I ducked down even further while still keeping an eye on the person. He was definitely taller, around 5'10". I wasn't phased though, as this could have been one of two people, Andrew's older brother or my friend Carson, both of whom were seekers. He continued approaching, and on his current course, he would pass about 20 feet to the right of me. The sounds of his footsteps were clear, leaves crunching and sticks snapping under his feet. Something that struck me as odd was that he wasn't using a flashlight, which is something seekers were allowed to do. He continued approaching and passed me about where I was expecting. When he was about to pass me, the neighbors let off a firework, which temporarily illuminated him. He had on a black sweatshirt and blue jeans, which is another odd thing. Neither Andrew's brother nor Carson was wearing that attire, or at least I can't remember them wearing those clothes. During the brief time the fireworks illuminated the man, I could just barely make out the silhouette of an object that was protruding out of what appeared to be a backpack. It was a skinny and long object with a hexagonal metal handle. I didn't see it long enough to decipher what exactly it was. Once he passed and continued through the forest, I decided to give myself up and run back uphill to the rendezvous point. Everyone who was playing the game was gathered there including who I suspected the seeker to be. I scratched my head. How could someone get back there so fast? I watched the man vanish into the trees, well beyond Andrew's yard. I proceeded to ask Andrew's brother and Carson if they went down by me. Carson said he was down near a break in the trail, but that was as far as he went. I knew where that break in the trail was, and I was hiding nowhere near there. Andrew's brother hadn't been in the forest. I began to feel uneasy. Why was a random person walking in a forest at 11 o'clock at night? He was so far off the trail, too. Eventually, I was able to brush the feeling off, and the sleepover I was having at Andrew's house with a few other friends took my mind off the incident. We were watching movies until around 3 in the morning. The next morning when we awoke... We turned on the TV to watch something, I can't remember. Despite the fact that Andrew had cable, his TV always defaulted to opening on a local news channel that I won't disclose. No matter what channel you left it on, the breaking news headline caught our attention. Body found near River Bottom. It originally said the city and river name, but I also don't want to disclose that. The reporter was interviewing a man who was pointing behind him. We immediately recognized the location, and my heart dropped in my chest. It was on the trail near Andrew's house. The body was buried slightly off the trail, with their legs being only partially buried, which is what led to the man's dog discovering it earlier in the morning. I believe the person that walked by me in the woods last night buried the body. I still think about what might have happened had the man discovered me. I don't know why my sense of danger didn't kick in. Perhaps I was too naive at the tender age of 12 to recognize danger. Or maybe it was the night concealing the man's details which didn't cause alarms to start going off. Certainly the scariest moment of my life, and I now have a fear of being alone at night, as well as going into forests in the dark. For this story, I'm going to call myself Anna, and my boyfriend's name is Adam. One night I was in bed with my boyfriend. It was about 1.30 a.m. I get a text from a random number saying, Is this Anna? Sorry for messaging late and out of the blue like this, but I don't think Adam is being honest with me, and I need to talk to you. We exchange a few texts, and basically, they're accusing my boyfriend of cheating on both of us. Obviously, I was annoyed, but bear in mind it was June 2020, right in the middle of lockdown in the UK. 
We had spent every day together since March. He denied it all and insisted he didn't know who this person was. The same number started texting him, angry texts, calling him a lying rat, etc. Not looking good for my boyfriend. But this is where it gets weird. This person gives no specifics. They won't tell me their name, what my boyfriend has done, only that he was a liar and that I was an idiot for believing him. I would ask, but they would just reply with vague, angry texts. Their grammar and spelling was good, but they would use slang words from our local area. We assumed maybe it was some kids who found our numbers off of Facebook and were having a laugh, so we tried ignoring it. Then nothing, until my boyfriend gets a text the following afternoon, asking him to meet them at a local social club for some company. Me and a friend got straight in the car and went down there. No one was there, and the club was closed, but we couldn't help feeling like we were being watched. It was really weird. A few days go by, and the same number starts texting me again. This time, the text language is all weird, with spelling mistakes. It felt like it was a different person texting me. They seem a lot angrier with me now, because I didn't believe them straight away. Then... They text me, You're so dull. I see him leaving your house earlier. LMAO. I said something like, That's funny, where's my house then? And they replied, with my street name. They also knew things about us like the fact he was in the army. Then they hung up. I tried calling them back several times, but it would ring twice and then cut off. I tried searching the number on WhatsApp and on a few social media sites. Nothing. Only on Instagram, the number would come up with a location of a film company in the Netherlands. When I would Google the number, its provider was Tizme. I've never heard of it, but looks like it might be just a fake number. They have never asked for any money or anything like that, either. I don't get why someone would go through that much effort just to wind us up. The last text I got from them was, You'll find out who this is eventually. LMAO. Creepy. I am 25 years old, and even though these events happened 11 years ago, I still remember them clearly, like it was yesterday. This is by far the creepiest thing I have ever experienced. When I was 14, my family and I moved out of town into a house situated right in the middle of a cane field. There was a dirt road that led from the main road to the front of our house, and the sides and back were surrounded by cane. I was what my parents called a fitness freak because exercise was my thing. So I took my dog, whose name was Jet, and went jogging early mornings and late afternoons every single day. Because we had just moved to this house, and it being surrounded by cane and all, I had to find a new track to continue my routine. Our house was two stories, and my bedroom window faced the front of our house, so I could see the main road. After finally moving in my stuff and setting up my bedroom at the new house, I noticed from looking out my window that there was a dirt road on the other side of the main road. Perfect, I thought. It was about 5.30 p.m., around the usual time I would go for my jog, so I decided I would go and check it out. The road was long and narrow, fitting no more than one car, as there were rows of cane on either side that stood tall, well above my head. I had been jogging for about 15 minutes, and looking back, I could no longer see the main road, as this track was straight, but then slightly curved, leading me, coming up towards another house. I could only see the roof of this house in the distance, as the cane was very high. As I got closer, I noticed a little boy in a red shirt sitting on top of the roof. He looked to be about five or six years old. I remember thinking how on earth did he climb up there? Does his parents know he's up there? Because for only the roof to be visible over the cane, it was obviously a two-story home. I stopped jogging and called my dog back who was running a couple meters ahead of me, and turned around to go back home. I wasn't interested in going all the way up to the house 
just in case I'd be trespassing private property, or if they also had dogs, as mine didn't get along with other pets. When I got home, my dad was sitting on the couch watching TV. I asked him if he knew the family who lived up the opposite dirt road. No, no one lives up there, he told me. Well, there must be people who live there. I just saw a little boy sitting on the roof. My dad looked at me and lowered his eyebrows as if he didn't believe me. No, Tori, no one lives there. It used to be an old workhouse that farmers used to store their tractors and equipment. I was so confused, questioning whether I had just imagined a little boy sitting up there. My 12-year-old sister walked out of the bedroom drying her hair with a towel. Gemma, come jogging with me this morning. Uh, why? Because I need to see if I'm just imagining something. Uh, okay. First thing in the morning, I dragged Gemma along to come jogging. We left the dog at home this time. So, what are you imagining? Yesterday I went jogging on this road, and down the end was a house with a little boy sitting on the roof. So... So Dad is saying that no one lives there, and it's bothering me. We got close enough where the roof was finally visible, and there was no little boy in sight. Let's go all the way to the house then, Gemma said, and hesitantly, I followed. When we got there, it became pretty clear that there couldn't possibly be anybody living in there. To try and describe it the best I can, it was a large, two-story old house covered in black streaks as if it had been burnt once before and had large square gaps on the front that clearly used to be windows. The stairs to get inside were at the back of the house, and behind that was a small, murky-colored lake. It seemed definitely abandoned and like it hadn't been used in many years. My dad was right about it once being a storage place for farmers. Around the yard were old tires, tractors, and cars. In all honesty, the whole place was straight up creepy. This is going to sound weird, but do you have a bad feeling of some kind? Gemma looked at me for a moment before agreeing. Um, Tori, is that the little boy? She said. Her voice was so shaky. Before I got a chance to ask where, Gemma was pointing towards a small room downstairs with a smashed hole in the window. Through the window was a little boy just sitting there. We both stared in shock for at least another second before bolting back down the road. We got home and busted through the door, telling mom and dad what we saw. My dad laughed. I told you girls no one lives there. I was getting frustrated. Dad, seriously, Gemma saw him too. They both just brushed it off and didn't think much of it. Being dumb teenagers and all, Gemma and I decided to go back to the house that afternoon and take the dog. When we got back there, we checked where we had saw the boy this morning, but he was gone. Jet was going crazy. We unclipped his leash from his collar and he took off running behind the house and up the stairs. We called out to him, but he wasn't coming back. Great, now we have to go get him. We walked around the back and started walking upstairs slowly. They were old, rickety and creaking with every step. Gemma got up the stairs before me because, admittedly, I was more scared. I was only halfway up before Gemma called out. Oh my god. What is it? Tori, you have to see this. I walked straight in as the front door was missing, and I had chills. On the dusty old floorboards were kids' crayon scribbles and small little blue shoes. If only Dad could see this. I immediately wanted to leave, but Gemma was still calling out to Jet, and he hadn't come back yet. We walked through the kitchen into an open room of the house and found Jet sitting there, staring at a large cardboard box, at least a meter tall. We looked inside, and it was full to the top of blank videotapes. Every part of me was screaming to get out. Gemma looked at me and slowly reached in to grab a tape when we heard quick and heavy footsteps coming from the front of the house, exactly as if someone were running towards us. We both panicked and got out of there as quickly as we could. It was late in the afternoon, 
and was getting dark. It started pouring down rain as we were running away, and as we got further down the road, we looked back, seeing a shape of a large man standing in the gap of the window, watching us. When we got home, we were sweaty and so far out of breath trying to explain to mom and dad what we had just witnessed. Videotapes? That's odd. Did you bring one back? Dad was curious now. My mom wasn't so interested. I don't think she believed us. We explained that when Gemma attempted to pick up a tape, we heard what sounded like someone running towards us. Even though it was now dark outside, my dad suggested he will go for a drive to the house and have a look. For some reason, even though Gemma and I were absolutely terrified out of our minds, we still decided to go with him. We drove slow up the dirt road. It was so dark and eerie, all we could see was the gravel of the road directly in front of the car, where the headlights shone. We pulled up at the house thinking it was scary enough during the day. It was like being in a horror movie during the night. We sat in the car, with the headlights shining directly onto the old creepy house and darkness surrounding everywhere else. My dad, Gemma, and I almost jumped out of our skin. I swear for a second, my heart actually stopped beating. It was the sound of a shot. It sounded like it was shot no more than a couple meters from our car. Dad immediately put the car into reverse and spun it around, about to drive off, when he just stopped. My heart was about to beat out of my chest, and I yelled, Dad, what are you doing? Gemma was almost crying in the front seat. I looked at both of them, and they were doing nothing but staring directly in front of the car. So, one thing I noticed on the way there was since it was raining a bit earlier, there were no tracks or anything marked on the road, so our tire tracks were the only ones. Then I saw it. Sitting perfectly upright on top of our tire tracks was a knife. It's safe to say that we never came back to this house, as it's quite obvious we were not wanted there. I began jogging on a track from the back of our house and have had a much better experience. Still, to this day, many questions remain in my head. I wonder, what was on those tapes, and why was there an entire box full of them? Who did they belong to? And why were they so protected? I was about 13 when my family went on our annual trip to Poland to visit family. My mother and father both came from a small rural village about two to three hours away from Warsaw. It's an idyllic little place that is surrounded by lush forest and wheat fields. Life is different there. Everyone is very carefree and relaxed. Being the small place it is, everyone knows one another since everyone essentially lives on the same street. I had made a bit of a reputation for myself there, being known as the American girl who visits in the summers, so whenever we would arrive the whole village would know. I loved all the attention, all the kids wanted to play, and adults doted on me. One of the townspeople I saw most frequently was Tomek. Tomek was a funny guy in his late 20s who would work in the village deli store. He would always give me extra meat anytime my grandparents would send me out to pick food up or offer to show me inside the kitchen. I never took him up on that offer. The idea of seeing how my meat was made was too much for my 13-year-old mind. Though I didn't know it at the time, Tomek had the reputation of being the town lunatic. He wasn't a stranger to the police force, nor the villagers, as he was a bit of a petty thief. My grandparents told me when I got older that my grandfather had not once but twice caught him trying the doors of his shed and then excusing himself when caught as drunk and unsure where he was. Despite this, I had never had a reason to fear or avoid him. The village had a tradition called Gra Adwagi, which translates to the game of courage that would fall in between the dates of our visits. On this day, the village children would be set into teams and then given items to find that were hidden around the woods and or the village parameters. The event lasted all day, and the group that had the most found items would win a prize. 
The courage part of the game would be trying to attain the golden item, which would be in the woods and guarded by a few adults armed with water sprayers or water guns. The only way to get the golden item was to avoid being sprayed with water. If all members of a team were hit, then the team would lose the chance to attain it. My team consisted of my four friends, Ava, Arik, Bartek, and Powell. Our strategy was to get as many of the items around town and then try our luck at the golden object when it got darker in order to be harder to spot. We got a lot of the items throughout the day and worked up a good sweat after racing against the other children. Around 7 p.m., we had attained 12 items and were ready to try our luck at the golden item. We had heard from the other children that the adults were being relentless, guarding the object with ferocity. The wooded area that was the destination as the golden item area was behind Arik's house. Therefore, he took the lead in devising the plan. Our plan was that we were going to split up into two teams. Eric, Ava, and Bartek were meant to grab the adults' attention and drive them away as far as possible, while Powell and I would sneak in and grab the item. Feeling confident, we headed into the forest as the sun was slipping from the sky. We followed the dirt path for about five minutes and then stepped off it, following Arik as he navigated through the shrubbery with ease. He stopped us just as we reached a thick clump of bushes. Putting a finger to his lips, he motioned for us to look through the gaps in the shrubbery and see the adults. It was dark now, so it was hard to see who was actually guarding the items, but we could make out four shapes huddled together, chatting softly. Without hesitation, we moved into our plan of action. Our three friends navigated around and disappeared from our sight only for us to hear their laughs and voices of adults yelling to get them. Powell and I watched as the adults raced after our friends, all abandoning the area they had stood around. I remember glancing around and getting ready to jump out of the bushes when I felt Powell's arm on my shoulder and heard him making a shushing sound. They might not all be gone. Wait a bit, he urged. We sat quietly, listening intently for any sounds. Then, it happened, the slightest sound of something moving on the other side of the clearing. We couldn't make out who or what it was, so we stayed quiet, peering through the gaps of the shrubbery. Powell saw it first. He pointed out what looked like a dark figure crouching behind a tree, closest to the clearing. We watched as the figure moved tree to tree, never stepping out from behind, just simply observing. Just as I was about to suggest that one of us should cause a distraction, we hear a yelp and turn to see another team approaching, clearly happy that there seemed to be no one around where the golden item should be. We watched as this small group of two raced around the clearing, but didn't pick anything up. I kept waiting for the adult to step out and spray the kids, but the figure remained crouched, half visible behind the trees. One of the girls approached the area the adult was, but she was busy looking up at a tree, motioning to her partner that maybe the object was put on a branch. We watched as she began pulling herself up the lowest branch, and I remember the way my stomach dropped when all of a sudden we saw the adult shoot out behind the tree, grab her leg, and start pulling her into the darkness of the forest. Her partner ran off screaming, leaving me and Powell unsure what to do. We watched frozen with horror as the adult began covering the girl's mouth in some attempt to silence her. Before either one of us could do anything, all of a sudden Tomek came running up the path and threw himself onto the man. Powell shot up to help Tomek while I ran back to call for help. When I reached the backyard that was the destination spot for the end of the game, I was screaming uncontrollably in a mix of words that took me a few attempts to get out that help was needed. A large group of the men raced towards the forest while I hid in my mother's arms awaiting to see everyone arrive back safely. My friends, Arik, Ava, and Bartek approached me cautiously and asked what had happened and why Powell and I hadn't come back. It had turned out that after Ava, Bartek, and Arik had distracted the adults and drove them away, the adults had decided to end the time to get the gold item. 
They had assumed that everyone had a chance to try to get it and didn't want the kids wandering the forest after dark. One of the adults had already pocketed the item when they chased our group back towards the main backyard. My team had assumed that we would see that there was nothing there and returned as well, which is why they didn't come looking for us. As I retold what happened, everyone in the backyard listened to me with wide eyes. About ten minutes passed, and we saw the group of men coming back. Powell walking aside his father and the girl who had been attacked in the arms of her assumed father. As they all approached, I asked Powell what had happened. As the parents gathered and talked in hushed voices, Powell described to us how Tomek had beat the guy bloody, but let him escape when he turned away, surprised by the men that had arrived to help. He mentioned that a few men were still out scouting the forest land for the guy. I then asked the remainder of my friends why help was not sent earlier by the girl's partner that had run away screaming. Everyone had looked at me with blank faces, and the sudden realization hit me hard. The next events became a blur. It's a mix of me racing to my parents with my friends and asking about the girl. A frenzy of people calling out her name and begging her to come out. A whirlwind of everyone rushing to get their kids inside and mayhem of adults swarming together to go search the woods again and call the police. It's been eight years now and she was never found. Tomek was one of the main suspects, believed to be part of the two-man kidnapping operation, but backed out when he saw that too much attention was brought to the event. I'm not sure whatever happened to him, but I can't help but feel guilty that I didn't do anything to help either of those girls. I saw the girl run away. Powell and I were the last to see her. Sometimes when I see a child with braided hair, I get thrown back to that night and I can still see her braids swirling around her as her figure disappeared from sight. Her name was Dorota, and I hope wherever she is, she's alive. <laughs>